Okay, so this is the final installment for Unit 4. It is the Reactions and Aqueous Solutions Part 2, where we talk about acid-base reactions and gas-evolving reactions. So we're going to continue talking about net ionic equations, which we technically began in the last video. And then we're going to look at the new definitions of acid and base that we're going to incorporate for this unit and how to determine the conjugate acid-base pair um, for a neutralization reaction. So we're going to start with acid-base reactions, and then we're going to move to gas-evolving reactions. So acid-base reactions are also called neutralization reactions. Here you have an acid reacting with a base to produce some kind of salt and water. A salt is just an ionic compound, so don't let that get you um, bogged down with trying to define it. It's just an ionic compound of some kind. So in Unit 2, we defined acid as any substance that produces H plus in solution. We're going to expand that or clarify it a little bit using the Bronston-Lowry definition, which is a little bit better. This says that an acid is any species that, species that donates a proton to solution. If you think about hydrogen, hydrogen has an atomic number one, mass number one, atomic number one, and it has one proton, one electron when it's neutral. If you have a positive charge, you then lose that electron. So you have one proton, no neutrons. It's just a proton. Now we still write it as H+, but it's a better definition um, overall. Now when an acid dissociates in solution, it's going to lower the pH. Now in Unit 2, we defined a base as something that had that would donate a hydroxide to solution when it dissociated. And the better definition is to say that it's going to be any substance that will accept a proton. Now, while that means that all um, hydroxide-containing compounds are still going to accept a proton to make water, it also allows weak bases like ammonia to be considered a base as well because then it can also accept a proton. Um, now, uh, when a base dissociates, it is going to increase the pH of solution, okay? Okay, so let's go ahead and look at what it means to change your pH. pH is just a scale that discusses or shows the molarity uh, of, or the acidity of a solution. Now, it is a really a logarithmic representation of the molarity of the H+. So these brackets indicate molarity. So the pH is equal to the negative log of the H plus concentration. On the scale, for 111, we deal with a scale of about 0 to 14. Anything below 7 is considered acidic. Anything with a pH above 7 is considered basic or alkaline. Now our stomach acid, our stomach pH is about pH of 1, with lemon juice and um, orange juice above that at 2 and 3, um, which is why, you know, you're not supposed to drink straight lemon juice, and not that you would want to, but it will eat away at the enamel on your teeth. Coffee is technically slightly acidic, um, which is why you can have dental problems if you drink too much coffee without, um, I don't know, brushing your teeth more often. Urine is also slightly acidic. Um, in fact, uh, it's one of the reasons why um, it's gross, but it's a good example. Uh, jellyfish stings are uh, technically a sting with a basic compound, and one of the ways that they talk about uh, neutralizing that is, you know, you pee on the sting. Um, it's supposed to help. Gross, but it helps. Um, distilled water is at a pH of 7. It is exactly neutral, neither acidic nor basic. At that pH, the amount of hydrogen, or H+, and the amount of hydroxide in solution is exactly equal. Anything above 
a pH of 7 is slightly basic. Seawater, baking soda are a little acidic, a uh, little basic. And then you get up here where ammonia is at a pH of 11, um, and then bleach is somewhere around 13. Now, it's really kind of interesting, though, because it really takes a while for people to see this. When, If you talk about a 1.0 molar HCl solution, the pH of that is negative log of 1.0. Entering that in the calculator, you get a pH of 0. If you had a 0 0.1 molar HCl solution, the pH of this is negative log of 0 0.1. That gives you a pH of 1, 0 0.000001 molar concentration. The pH of negative log of that. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, is about a pH of 6, okay? It is a logarithmic scale where each number represents a factor of 10. Now, your reading goes on a little bit to talk about how pH plus pOH is equal to 14, and the pOH is going to be the negative log of the hydroxide concentration. These are helpful formulas. But for the most part, we don't deal with that until Chemistry 112. We're going to be dealing with it primarily um, in these terms this semester. So what I want you to be able to do is recognize an acid, recognize a base, recognize the conjugates, and um, be able to write a net ionic equation for these guys. Now, strong acids. Now, we said that an acid is anything that donates a proton to solution. But most acids are not going to completely ionize. Remember we were talking about electrolytes being things that completely ionized? So things like sodium compounds, acetate compounds, um, let's use nitrate instead, nitrate compounds. These completely dissociate, so these are strong electrolytes. Now most um, acids, things like HF or acetic acid, these are weak acids. They only partially dissociate, and so they're weak electrolytes. But it turns out that there's so many weak acids, it's hard to memorize those. And so instead, what I want to point out are the strong acids, because there's only six. These strong acids completely dissociate, which means every single molecule in solution is going to be in its ionic form. So all HCLs are present as H and Cl minus that sort of thing. Because they completely dissociate, they are strong electrolytes. Now, strong bases, oh, excuse me. So these are the six strong acids. You have hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic, hydrochloric, uh, chloric acid, nitric acid, sulfuric acid. See why I asked you guys to memorize these polyatomic ions, chlorate, nitrate, sulfate. This chloric acid, nitric acid, sulfuric acid are the strongest acids there are. They are, um, well, they're intense. We'll leave it there. Um, I don't think you guys handle nitric acid this semester. I don't remember. Um, we've changed things around some. Uh, nitric acid is so strong that it completely ionizes uh, or oxidizes it, oxidizes Oh my, oxidizes your skin as soon as it comes in contact with it. It will actually turn your skin, as soon as it touches your skin, it turns it, turns it this burnt orange, and it forms kind of a callus there. Um, and even if you wash your skin as soon as it touches it, um, basically you have that callus until it flakes off a few weeks later. Um, it's intense. So um, sulfuric acid is present very weakly and um, very dilute in onions, and it's those fumes are what make you cry when you cut an onion. Um, they are, even in small amounts, very strong compounds. Strong bases are also going to completely dissociate, so they're also going to be um, strong electrolytes. These tend to be group 1 metals paired with uh, hydroxide. 
Group 1 is called alkali. Alkali metals with hydroxide make alkaline compounds. That's why they're named that. Now you could have reactions between a weak acid and a strong base, um, or actually this is a weak base, isn't it? Um, kind of strong, but not really. Or you could have um, strong of one and weak of the other. It doesn't matter. The hydrogen and hydroxides are going to combine to make high, uh, to make water, um, and you're going to get a salt. Now I will point out, because you guys deal, deal with acetic acid some, acetic acid is one of the exceptions. We usually don't write it as H, CH3COO. We write it as CH3COOH. It has to do with bonding and the organic nature of the acid. Um, but for right now, I just want to point out that that's what acetic acid looks like. Um, so here, HCl and ammonia. Um, ammonia is the base here because it's going to accept the proton from hydrochloric acid. So you get an ammonium and a chloride ion. Um, down here, you have ammonia reacting with water. Here, water is acting as the acid. It's going to be donating a hydrogen or a proton to ammonia to make ammonium, and you're left with hydroxide. So this is why ammonia is considered a base. It makes hydroxide in water, OK? Now, your reading does a pretty good job of talking about um, of talking about, this is a really bad error. There we go. Um, your reading does a good job of talking about conjugate acids and bases, but I want to talk about it here. On the left, whatever donates a proton is going to be your acid, OK? Whatever is going to accept the proton in the chemical reaction is your base. But on the other side, what that person made is it's conjugate. So here, for example, ammonia is a base. But in order to go back to ammonia, this ammonium would have to donate this proton. So this is the conjugate acid of ammonia. Here, water donated a proton here, so it was the acid. But to go back to water, it would have to gain a proton or accept one. So hydroxide is the conjugate um, base. So if it's acting as a base on the left, it's going to be the conjugate acid on the right. The substance that's an acid on the left is going to be the conjugate base on the right. Now, in addition, I'm not going to ask you to write net ionic equations for weak acids or weak bases, um, but I will ask, be asking you to write them um, for strong acids and strong bases because you have to know those. Um, now, these compounds, because they always dissociate, they're aqueous, aqueous, they're going to form an aqueous salt and water. The net ionic equation for these is always going to be hydrogen plus hydroxide goes to water. And if we write this out, aqueous means H plus plus Cl minus aqueous. This is aqueous, so it's sodium aqueous plus OH minus aqueous goes to sodium aqueous plus chloride aqueous. And because this is water, it's a liquid, it does not break apart. So it stays that way. We get rid of our spectator ions, which is going to be what's present on both sides in the same form. So our chlorines and our sodiums go away. We get hydrogen plus hydroxide goes to water. The most common type of acid-base reaction is called a titration. Now, these neutralization reactions are um, what happens when you get an unknown substance. Usually, that unknown is going to be an acid-containing substance. 
you can do it the other way around, but acid is usually the unknown. We call that unknown substance that we are evaluating the analyte. So you have an unknown substance in a flask with an indicator. That indicator allows the solution to change color as soon as it gets to the end point. Then you have a burette with a stopcock that you can control. The burette has the solution of known concentration. Usually the titrant in here is going to be the base. And you add that dropwise until you get the color change. Now if our titrations were exactly perfect, you would be able to stop at the equivalence point or when you have exactly equal acid and equal base. That doesn't happen. Almost every indicator we use has a slightly basic um, changing point. And so usually when you see the color change, it's at the end point. Um, so when you guys do, I think it's lab 10, you'll be doing a titration um, where you use phenylphthalein as an indicator and it turns pink just at after the equivalence point, it's at the end point. So how much of a 0.5 molar solution of NaOH is needed to react with 0.88 liters of 1.2 molar HCl? I'll be honest, I really prefer to have my reaction written, so I'm going to go ahead and write that here. It's HCl plus NaOH goes to NaCl plus water. HCl is aqueous because chloride is usually aqueous and hydrogen isn't an exception. Um, or you could say sodium hydroxide and HCl are strong acids, so they're completely going to break apart. NaCl is completely aqueous because it's a sodium and a chloride compound. Either one would make that a, uh, aqueous. And water is a liquid. And just as a check, guys, sodium has a plus one charge, chlorine has a minus one charge, um, NaCl is the right formula there. Now let's go back to this question. If we had 0 0.500 molar NaOH and we had 0 0.88 liters of 1.2 molar HCl, if we look at this, we know from our mole concept map that we can go from liters of HCl to liters of NaOH. We can go from liters to moles of HCl using the molarity, which we're given. We can go from moles of HCl to moles of NaOH using the balanced equation, which we have. And then we can go back from moles of NaOH to liters of NaOH using the molarity, which we have. So this is a three-step process. So I'm going to go ahead and set it up with three columns. Not even columns, but there we go. And we're going to start with the 0 0.88 liters of HCl. Every time we have one liter of HCl, we have 1.2 molar H or moles, I should say moles, moles of HCl. According to our balanced equation, every time we react one mole of HCl, we react one mole of NaOH. And then, according to this molarity, if we have 0 0.500 moles of NaOH, we have one liter of NaOH. So in your calculator, Checking our units, liters cancels, moles of HCl, and moles of NaOH cancel. So in your calculator, you have 0.88 times 1.2 divided by 0.5. And you end up getting something like 2.1 liters of NaOH. Now, here we have a solution of sodium hydroxide reacting with phosphoric acid. This is meant to be a review of what phosphoric acid looks like. 
So if you need to go back and review those polyatomic ions, now is the time. Sodium has a plus one charge. Phosphate is three minus. We're going to need three of these and one of these to make sodium phosphate and water. To balance, we have three sodiums over here. We need three over here. Na is good. We've got three and three. Hydroxide, H, and PO4. Remember, we can think about water as hydrogen and hydroxide. So over here we have three, but over here we only have one. We need to add a three here to make that three. We've got three hydrogens over here, one phosphate, one phosphate, and we're balanced. I'm going to move this plus so it doesn't look like that's an 8. Now, here we have a question. 0 0.175 molar sodium hydroxide. And we're going to react that with 0 0.62 liters of 0 0.25 molar phosphoric acid. We can do the exact same thing. We're going to go from liters of phosphoric acid all the way to liters of NaOH. We can first go to moles using molarity. Then we get to moles of NaOH using our mole to mole ratio. And then we can go to liters using the molarity of NaOH. So it's again a three-step process where we start with 0 0.62 liters. We know every time we have one liter of H3PO4, we can have 0, oops, 0 0.25 moles of H3PO4. According to the balanced equation, if we react one mole of H3PO4, we need three moles of NaOH. And then every time we have 0 0.175 moles of NaOH, we have one liter. So that's going to give us 0 0.62 times 0.25 times 3 and then divided by 0.175. And ends up giving you something like 2.7 liters of NaOH. Now guys, this looks exactly like a couple of questions for your labs coming up. Um, so make sure you get comfortable performing these calculations. And if you have to, use your mole concept map until that happens. Six two point two five three. Let me just make sure I did that right and that that is a typo. I know it's because, um, this is right. I must have changed my numbers a little bit. So there you go. Gas evolving reactions are always going to be, produce gas as a product. They can be combustion reactions, single replacement reactions, decomposition reactions, um, and they're also usually going to be classified as redox. Here you have hydrogen by itself being produced. It's going to have a redox number of zero. Um, so this is a single replacement reaction that is also redox and gas evolving. And here we have a decomposition reaction where, again, it goes from minus 2 to 0 for oxygen. So you, again, have a decomposition reaction that is going to be a gas evolving reaction and a redox equation. That is it for this unit. Um, if you have any questions, just make sure you uh, post to the help.